Hip Hip Tally Ho Jules Guides here in which I wander around London and tell you fascinating facts. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button if you like these videos and hit the little bell because that will notify you uh, when I upload a new one. Don't worry, you won't get any emails or anything. Now, one of my favourite periods of London history is the Georgian period. You've got like costume dramas, men with their powdered periwigs, Bridgerton, Mutiny on the Bounty. So, when my friend Clinton, who's just done a lecture at his kid's school about black history and for Black History Month, he suggested to me, why don't you do a video all about the black people living in London in Georgian times? And I said, yes, excellent idea, as long as you help me. So we're going to help him him now. Clinton! <laughs> Good to see you. And a uh, handshake for little Oslo. But looking very dapper as usual, nice hats. Oh, well, I know, just trying to emulate you, you know. Ian Wright, Ian Wright. <laughs> yeah, I've got to get me one of them. <laughs> I didn't realise that there were quite so many black people in London around the end of the 18th or 19th century. Well, I mean, I think it's one of the misconceptions that people have is that one, Firstly, that no black people existed in England before Windrush. Well, that's rubbish. <laughs> During the 18th century, you know, there was about maybe 15,000 black people in London. But also, right back to Charles II is when boats started going down towards Africa and bringing back people, not as slaves, but sometimes just because they needed them to understand English to help with the trade they might in have Africa. princes and stuff. Princes, right. uh, performers. performers. Now, I've covered Dr. Johnson before in my videos. I've been to Dr. Johnson's house. Um, he's the guy who, who wrote the first um, proper extensive English dictionary. You know, we've all seen Blackadder and everything. So why are you taking me back here? Well, Dr. Johnson had a servant called Francis Barber, who was the black man who lived with Dr. Johnson in this very house. This is, the, this is the door that, that they would have used. That's I mean, right. this is a fortnight. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. 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 Welcome to Dr. Johnson's house. Come through. Thank you. Oh, it's a terrific. I love coming here. It's such a good house. Francis Barber was born into slavery in Jamaica on a sugarcane plantation to the Bathurst family. And about eight years later, the family moved over to, to England and brought with them what they called a handful of their favourites, including a very young Francis Barber. And then when Johnson lost his wife, he fell into quite a serious depression. His friends were quite concerned that he wasn't leaving the building, he wasn't receiving visitors, he never had any servant staff at that point. And that's why Barber ended up here in 1752, around the age of 10. How did he manage to stay for so long? Johnson felt very strongly against the practice of slavery. I think he felt the need to take care of him. His age, being a little boy of 10 years old, spurred him into being quite responsible for him. Yeah. So if yeah. there's an, oh my God, they were short in those days, weren't they? <laughs> so look, if they haven't got, um, uh, is there anything else that, that he might have, um, where, where yes. did he sleep? I, I mean, would what? love to show you a couple of places in the house which I think are really uh, strongly associated with Barber. Uh, so this room would have been a bedroom, at least for a period used as a bedroom by Barber. And this significant document on the wall. So that's a will? It's a will. This will is remarkable because Barber is named effectively as Johnson's sole heir. What did he get? Johnson had asked on his deathbed uh, a friend of his, uh, what's the typical amount you could leave to a servant in your will? And he was told £50 was considered extremely generous for a nobleman. And Johnson just quit. Well, I intend to be nobilissimus then, for I shall leave Barber £70 a year. Did he get married? He did get married. He got married to an English woman called Elizabeth Ball, and they went on to have two, three children. So if he's married a white English lady, yeah. and then they probably had kids as well, then their descendants today are quite likely white people who might not even know, uh, you know. Well, like... you make a good point there. You know, remember we mentioned earlier there was 15,000... Um, black uh, people in London. Quite often they married into white relationships. As time goes by, the black part of their genes get less manifest. So quite often there may be white people who are totally unaware that they've got black heritage. Actually, we do have a good relationship with Barber's direct descendant called Cedric Barber, and he does look entirely white. What happens to Francis Barber thereafter? He opened a school. He's thought to be the first black schoolmaster in, in English history. We come down to Bank, 
uh, off Cornhill and look, Simpsons, it's an absolute tragedy. Look, the sale, this is where Scrooge has his supper in the uh, Christmas Carol. I think they've got some sort of problem with the, uh, the landlord or something or the rent, and it's, mm. but this has been here since the 18th century. It's one of the oldest restaurants in London, Simpsons. And just around the corner from Simpsons is the uh, Jamaica Wine House. Well, wine bar, they call it these days. Yeah, the, uh, the Jamaica, Jamaica Wine, wine House. Bar. This is, uh, was originally was, was the oldest coffee house in London. And what do you want to put in your coffee? Sugar. Uh, and there was a, a triangle of trade that was happening during that time. Slaves being taken from Africa to the British colonies to work on the sugar plantations. The sugar was taken to the UK and then from the UK those ships would leave again to the African coast to trade for slaves and so the triangle continued. Funny enough, just around there is where the abolitionists um, first convened to start their campaign against uh, slavery. This whole area is where the stock exchange died and the insurance companies, and they all started up meeting in coffee houses. These were information superhighways of the times. If an enslaved person you know, ran away, this is where they'll put a poster out to try and get them returned. Went away from his master, the 20th instant, a boy named James. Whoever brings him to the Jamaica coffee house in Cornhill mm. shall have 10 shillings reward. Ignatius Sancho, of course. We've come down here to Whitehall. We're outside the Foreign Office. Ignatius Sancho was an erudite, charismatic, and rather splendid fellow who, who lived here in the 18th century. And he led a quite a remarkable life. Well, the thing is, this is where his shop, in his later life, he owned a shop, which is very rare for a black person, because imagine in those days actually being the owner of property, where lots of the early abolitionists came and talked and began the whole series of events that eventually led to the abolition of slavery. He wrote music, he wrote plays, he wrote stories. He actually wrote lots of letters to influential people at the time. Yeah. Charles Street, September the 2nd, 1779, which is this. This is Charles Street. I hope you get into friendly chatty parties for the evenings. If I might obtrude my silly advice, it should be to dissipate a little with the girls. But for God's sake, beware of sentimental ladies. <laughs> With their shining faces and smooth tongues drain unwary young men's pockets. It's one of the things that's um, remarkable, Ignatius. He didn't only care about the plight of the black people at the time, he actually generally cared about humanity. And another funny thing about what you read there, he was very much in the Kurt Vonnegut style of writing. Oh, right. Yeah, he'd yeah. be on one topic and then something will drop and he will just switch it. There's another great bit about, I don't know if you can find it, about when he was writing and his ink blotted. And he goes, oh dear, there's a, there's a blot. And <laughs> I'll have you know, it was not me that caused that blot, but the pen itself. You know, he, was, he was wonderful like yeah, that. Yeah. There is actually a really good book. Um, Patterson Joseph, the famous actor, has written a book all about it. Is, is it fair to say that Ignatius Sancho is kind of your alter ego? Is that uh, your alter ego is strong, but he does possess me. I have, to, I have to say, as soon as I start reading anything by him, any of his letters or anything, I just yeah. go into a sort of 18th century mode. The guy was born on a slave ship. So the fact that he ended his life as a shop owner and therefore able to vote, and he became quite educated of his own bat. The fact that he went from that to that is so extraordinary that he's, he needs to be studied just to find out how a black man could do that in the 18th century. I mean, how did he go from being born on a slave ship to... <laughs> he had the luck to run into the Duke of Montague. Now, Lord Montague lived here in Blackheath at Montague House. This is all that's left of it, unfortunately. But across the park in Greenwich is where Ignatius Sancho was living with these three sisters who he was gifted to as a small boy. And Lord Montague used to sometimes go and visit these three sisters and lend the, the little boy books. And he taught himself to read, but he hated it there so much that after about 20 years, he ran away and he came and stayed with Lord Montague here. But he ended up being his butler. He even got his portrait painted by Gainsborough, who was painting Lady Montague. And it's quite cool, actually. You can still see the bricked-in windows over here of the old Montague house. He would have probably looked through these windows. It's a pity the whole house isn't there anymore, but it probably looked a bit like that one that's next door, the uh, ranger's house. When he got too old to continue being a, a valet and butler for them, they gave him a stipend and they gave him a lump sum. And with that lump sum, he bought a shop in this location, which meant he was the first black man to own property 
in the UK and the first to have voted in a English parliamentary election. So this is like the church over there, St. Okay. Margaret's. So Ignatius That's Sancho right. got married in St. Margaret's, the same church that Churchill, Churchill. got married wow. in. Wow. Yeah. And it's also buried over there. I mean, we can't find a gravestone. It's not marked or anything. Yeah. But we do know that he was the first person of African descent to have his obituary officially recorded in the British press at the time. Oh, that's cool. So I've come back up to Kenwood. I've been here in one of my other videos, actually, but um, coming back to Kenwood House to meet someone I haven't seen for absolutely ages, like over 20 years. Um, and he got in touch after I mentioned him in my tooting video quite recently. And there he is, look, it's a TV presenter of shows like The Gadget Show, Live and Kicking, and also a fellow contestant on Blind Date with me about 30 years ago. It's Otis Dealey. <laughs> How Lovely you to see you, man. Good to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming up. So, look, I've already been to Kenwood House in my Kenwood uh, video, I think you'll find. It's, it's, it's an excellent video, but what, so why have you brought me back here? Well, you, you were here, yes, that is fact, but you forgot to mention one of the most important occupants of this building, Dido Bell. So she was the daughter... Uh, I was aware I was coming here, so I did quickly <laughs> read up. I, I did quickly read up. Her father was a British naval officer called Sir John Lindsay, and her mum was called Maria Bell, who may have been enslaved at some point, but we don't really know. What recent research suggests is that Dido Bell was born in London in 1761, free. Her father then placed in care of a very important man who lived here. And that was Lord Mansfield, her dad's uncle, who was like the chief justice, a really high up judge. And see, what I did know about this before was that it was later on bought by that guy who like, ran the Guinness Brewery or something. Yes. And he, he rescued it from being so flattened and turned into like luxury flats or something. <laughs> it's so nice that it's still there. Yeah. You might have seen the film Bell, 2013 film starring Gugu and Oh, uh, yeah, 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 I remember it, yeah, yeah. OK, which was a rather romanticised account of her time here at Kenwood House. <laughs> Romanticized. Nice when you can get it. We should get inside. Let's go inside, have a look. She looks happy then. She, she does, does, doesn't she? The, this painting was painted in the orangery. Oh, right really? Just next door. I know you can see, you can see St Paul's just in the background oh, yeah. there, you see? Look, I like that. Is, is that Chiswick Bridge then? No. This is that fake bridge just down at the bottom oh, there. <laughs> <laughs> Chiswick Bridge? Yeah, I've had good eyesight from there. It was, no, it was yes. A so that I hadn't, I had no idea that this bridge was like that. Uh, like, yeah, I always thought it just had stuff behind it. But look, it used to actually go over a little yeah, kind of running yeah. type so river thing. Ah, oh, so good. Story, um, but it does seem as if her life here was comfortable and she was cared for. Like this one, for example, like a page from Lord Mansfield's will mentioning his great niece Dido. Did he leave us stuff? Yeah, so Lord Mansfield left Dido her continued freedom. But why did I thought that she was born, if she was born free, why did he need to do that? Well, you need to remember that these were still quite challenging times, and, and his fear was that her freedom status could have been changed once he had passed on. So he was very keen to stipulate that she remained free. And yeah. he also left her an annual pension of £100. So what sort of stuff did she do here then? Well, Dida was educated. She worked for her uncle, taking down really important notes for him. You can see she had wonderful handwriting. And this was a letter written to Lord Manfield's dictation. A ship cannot be questioned for anything she has done during her former voyage, as for having carried contraband for subjects, having traded with the enemy, they can only be seized for carrying or trading on that voyage. This was written by Dido. I hope you will be able to read it. I mean, I can read it. I just don't understand. <laughs> the language <laughs> it's, it's old. It's old. So, but if you've got kids and stuff, can you come and bring them here and try this sort of oh, stuff on? Come. That's what they're for. Oh, that's what they're for. Okay, yeah, I think so. So maybe not for grown-ups. <laughs> not for not for grown-ups. Is, is that? Middle grade in one of Is that okay? Yeah. Can't, can't stop them, Children though. of all ages, especially my age. No, but what's that? What's that? That getaway? That's cat. So that's Cat, Mr. Blackadder. 
Excellent. Now, look, we've come down here to Telegraph Hill down in south-east London because, look, this is Alauda Equiano. Now, I've spoken about him in some of my films before. He's also known sometimes as Gustavus Vassa. I believe he lived around this area. Despite being sold into slavery when he was a small child, he could play the French horn, he could write English better than your average person, and he ended up becoming the father figure of the whole abolitionist movement. One person he was sold to was a merchant who let him sort of do these little side trades himself. And he was so good at it that he ended up being able to buy his own freedom. And then he wrote his autobiography, detailing all the horrors of slavery which he had experienced, and he actually became a bestseller. So, Otis, what was his book called? The Interesting Narrative of Alauda Equiano, or Gustavus Vassa, the African. The stench of the hold, the heat, and the crowding which meant that each had scarcely room to turn, almost suffocated us. The air soon became unfit for respiration from a variety of loathsome smells and brought on a sickness among the slaves of which many died. This wretched situation was aggravated by the rubbing of the chains and the filth of the lavatory tubs into which children often fell. The shrieks of the women and the groans of the dying rendered the whole scene of horror almost inconceivable. And he went off around the whole of like the UK, mm -hmm. you know, like doing book shows, he, tours. He, he was a real hero. He promoted the book extensively. It was hugely uh, popular. I think he met the Queen, or, or maybe he just presented a petition to her. I don't know if you met her. Queen Charlotte, who was the wife of King George III, I supplicate your majesty's compassion for millions of my African countrymen who groan under the lash of tyranny in the West Indies. Tortures, murder, and every other imaginable barbarity and inequity are practiced upon the poor slaves with impunity. I hope the slave trade will be abolished. I am your majesty's most dutiful and devoted servant to command, Gustavus Vassa, the oppressed Ethiopian. So I will probably have to cut to my old image of this because, I mean, it's so bloody annoying that people do that. I mean, what sort of person splats out over all this? These, these people, famous people lived in the area. Well, this is a contested image of Laura Equiano. This image, which widely comes up when you do a search for him, yeah, yeah. is not Alauda Equiano. Oh, right. Um, it is a portrait of an unknown individual of African descent. But it's not him. If you want a better idea of what Alauda looked like, it's on the cover of his book. All oh, right. This is the American church, right next to Good Street Station. There aren't any graves here or anything, but, but this is where Alauda Equiano is buried, mm -hmm. here. Um, but he does have a crater named after him on Mercury. The Equiano Crater on the planet Mercury. There is also a rum. Is there? Named after Equiano. Is there? Yes, there Maybe is. Maybe we can go and have something. I was going to say, I'll oh, introduce, okay. I'll introduce okay. you to that at another time. <laughs> Thanks, I really sir. enjoyed it, man. Thank Thanks. you for inviting Let's me. Let's hug it out, hug it out. <laughs> I've come down here to the river to come and meet friend of the show and co-author of this excellent book, Enslaved. It's all about the sunken history of the transatlantic slave trade, endorsed by Samuel L. Jackson, marine archaeologist, Dr. Sean Kingsley. This, of course, is a landscape of great power. Tower Bridge, the Tower of London. If you go back to the 17th century, it was exactly the same. This is where the slave trade began. And the skippers of the Royal African Company would come here, they'd go over the custom steps just up to Leadenhall Street where African House was. And you'd pick up all kinds of baubles, so everything from French brandy to linen, anything that you could buy low and you could sell high. And these things, copper manila bracelets. These are lumps of very, very cheap, bad quality copper. You'd fill your hulls with these, you go all the way to West Africa, and for 200 copper manilas, you could buy an African slave. So who was the Royal African Company? So the Royal African Company was uh, a company set up by uh, the royals at the time, Charles II. The Royal African Company was the only company who were allowed to transfer slaves from Africa to the Americas. 
And I'm just going to go over here because sometimes when you're down here by the river, uh, you see these people called mudlarks scavenging down on the foreshore looking for old artefacts and little bits and pieces which have washed up over the last few centuries. It's friend of the show, and not you again, uh, Monica, <laughs> but with some other mudlark friends. Um, Fran and Judy. Judy, excellent to meet you. Thanks for bringing us these amazing finds. I mean, so this is all stuff you found down here. It is, yeah. It is, yeah. Fran, tell me about these things. What, what are those? That looks nice. Well, this one here is it's a chevron trade slave bead. It's 18th, 19th century. The colours, red, white and blue, there's a hidden message there and it was used for commodity and also, sadly, for trading with slaves. So one of them, maybe, was like, exchanged two. for a, a human being? Is that, is that what you're saying? Is that what... It could be, it yeah, could be, yeah. 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 The slave master couldn't buy these, or couldn't make them, actually, um, in, in Africa. They would always have to be imported. These are the colours of Ghana. They'd be put on a piece of string around the neck to show the wealth of the individual. This one, it's a moon bead. And if you look at it under candlelight, it actually shines like a full moon. It's absolutely mm. beautiful. And this was particularly popular in, with the Yoruba tribe. So this would command a massive price. So it was therefore exchanged for humans as well, which is horrendous. This is a coffee house token. So if um, you bought coffee or whatever and you didn't have, they didn't have enough change, they gave you one of their tokens to use back in their shop. Yeah. That's a sugar cone. Somebody that sells sugar. It's incredible. So is that like the loyalty card of the period. 1663 to wow. 1672. You can see this elephant with a castle on its back, a couple of native Africans on the side, and it says Royal Company of Adventurers. They were the predecessors to the Royal African Company, weren't yeah, they? That's right. There's very few black minority and ethnic group people that actually go down to the foreshore. And for me, it's looking at the ancestry, it's my heritage. And it just took me straight back to my ancestors and what they might have gone through. <laughs> Now this is quite interesting. Loads of people walk past Trafalgar Square all the time and they don't realise that there's actually one of the... I mean, what do you call it? A, a, it's not a statue, it's a relief. A, a relief of a black person on there. And that's very unusual, let alone something that was put in there in the like well, 19th century. So there was a George Ryan who was on HMS Victory, the Battle of Trafalgar that this relief depicts. Um, and it, it's really interesting because this guy, you know, he's looking up, it, it's a photograph in time in 1805 at the Battle of Trafalgar. Nelson's just been hit by what they say is a sharp shooter, but actually it was a lucky strike from 20 meters away. And he's fallen there, the bullets hit him in the shoulder. Everything here is deliberate. You can't just say that they believed in political correctness at this time, because they really didn't. So, you know, it's really interesting they chose to illustrate a black guy. I mean, we know that Nelson on HUS Victory, ship of about 821 people, he had 10 black people. And the whole of the Battle of Trafalgar, there were 18,000 troops and soldiers, a hundred of those were black. Quite a lot of black people would go to sea because once you're on that ship, you are unequal because everyone had to be there for each other. It was a good way to earn a life at that time. By the time you've sweated and you've died and you've shed blood for one another, you become kind of brothers in arms. Yeah. Whilst I'm plugging all these blooming books, I might as well plug my own book, this amazing Jules Scott, and this is the actual original. This is the first time oh, okay. that I've shown this. Look, it's got the nice, uh, like it. you can see I've do a quick flick through. It's got lots of pictures of me, anecdotes, wonderful sizzling walks all around London. Check the links below. Don't forget to get your hands on the copy. <laughs> A lot of the black people in the Merchant Navy and a lot of the, the ones who, who were fighting on the British side in the American War of Independence ended up coming to London and they didn't necessarily have a pension, did they? So they ended up having to resort to things like begging on the streets and street performance. And some of them had quite elaborate costumes and descriptions like uh, Joseph Johnson, he used to wear uh, a, a huge ship on his head. Oh, uh, wait a minute, is, yeah. is he going to be in my book, right? Vagabondiana. Yeah. Now this is quite good, this. Yes. Wait, wait, but Vagabondiana or anecdotes of mendicant wanderers through the streets of London with portraits of the most remarkable. Yeah. And there's a sketch of that fella you're talking about yeah, here. Joseph Johnson, that's right, yes. <laughs> Check him out. Louisa, what do you make of that hat? Um, <laughs> very, very nautical indeed. But the novelty induced Black Joe to build a model of the ship Nelson, Ooh. to which when placed on his cap, he can, by a bow of thanks or a supplicating inclination to a drawing room window, 
<laughs> um, give the appearance of sea motion. So people would look out their windows and yeah. see this man sort of hat bobbling on, bobbling on. <laughs> but yeah. that's what he actually looked. I mean, that's a sketch taken at the time by this fellow did this book. Mm. And this fellow was walking around here like that. A very that. enterprising fellow, I should say. Well, I mean, and there's, a, there's another fellow whilst we're here, because there's another, we're, we're here out at the bottom of Ludgate Hill. Charles McGee, yes, he was another character of the day, entertaining the populace on the streets. This singular man usually stands at the foot of Ludgate Hill. This portrait was drawn on the 9th of October, 1815, opposite the famous Well of St Bridget. Well, this is St Bridget because St Brides used to be known as St Bridget's, and so this actual picture of old McGee was done here. We've come down to Senate House. I think it was George Orwell in 1984. He based the Ministry of Truth on this building. I think it's because his wife worked there or something during the war. And it's appeared in lots of films. I think it's in Batman and all sorts of things. But we've come here to look at this plaque, haven't we? Now, Mary Print is the only female voice we have that talk about the experiences she's had as a slave in the British colonies. Keen to mention, it's not actually blue. The <laughs> plaques have been made black and they've been made black on purpose. They are called black plaques. Now, this is where she lived later after she ran away. But Mary Prince was born into slavery in Bermuda. But I want to go to a house around the corner in Lee Street because that's where she lived when she first came to London. Not sure which house it is, but it was one of these because these were here at the time. This is where the, the Woods family brought her from Antigua and she lived with them here before running away to the Anti-Slavery Association where she ended up with the Pringles. The Pringles, as in Thomas Pringle, who was secretary of the Anti-Slavery Society. And it was when no she way. was there that she was encouraged to write uh, this account of her horrific ordeal. That's right. The stories that were heard over that period were mainly from men who related what happened as slaves in that period. It was called The History of Mary Prince, a West Indian slave related by herself. I had scarcely reached my 20th year when I was sent to be sold. I cannot bear to think of that day. It was too much, all that we love taken away from us. I then saw my sisters led forth and sold to different owners. When the sale was over, my mother hugged and kissed and mourned over us. It was sad parting. One went one way, one went another, and our poor mother went home with nothing. And I went to three editions. For it to go to three editions so soon was primarily because there was such interest in her story, and that was only two years before the 1833 Abolition Act came out, so without a doubt, it proved very influential at the time. Mr. D has often stripped me naked, hung me up, by the wrist and beat me with the cowskin with his own hand till my body was raw with gushes. Yet there was nothing very remarkable in this. Presumably the Wood family were pretty annoyed about these terrible descriptions of, exactly. of her treatment in there. On the publishing of this book, uh, Thomas Pringle was sued for libel by the Woods family and because there was no one to corroborate Mary's story, Mr Wood was victorious and Pringle had to pay him £25 and quite a few of the people from the society themselves also found these stories so harrowing, so difficult to deal with that they found it hard to believe Mary Prince. So it's very important that she had the courage to relate this story to the people and to the Pringles. She had two crosses to bear. Yeah. One so being black, one being a woman. So Cheers, Simon. Cheers, Lou. Cheers, Cheers Clinton. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button if you like these videos. And don't forget to buy one of these mountains of books that we're plugging today. We've got Dr. Sean Kingsley's amazing book, Enslaved, hey, highly recommended. Patterson Joseph's book about Ignatius Sancho. Yeah. And uh, the most important book of all. The uh, only book that matters. This, that's right. It's the Jules Guide's rather splendid London walks. Mm. 20 sizzling walks full of fun, uh, excitement, the Sweeney. And, and pictures. Yeah, photos of me. <laughs> See you next time. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers.